I can promise you that you will not have dry eyes after hearing today's guest, Chuck Keels. But it's not just about sadness. He speaks about the hope to come. Listen now. Chuck Keels, thank you so much to uh, for being on our No Gray Areas podcast. This podcast is really about the power of choice, the complexity of choice, and your story certainly fits because just to give the audience just a taste, um, you're a cancer survivor. Um, 2015, 2015 was that when you were diagnosed, yeah. right? And so we're going to get in all of that, but um, you started a foundation, you go around and you speak about this, you met your, your wife uh in do, when you guys were going through cancer together right because of cancer yep yep so we're gonna get on all that and then just in november uh, you lost her to cancer mm-hmm. and so you're in that grieving process right now but you certainly have a tremendous amount to speak into choice the choices that we make right mm-hmm. absolutely so let's back up and just go uh to 2015 i'm assuming that was a shock to you like it is to most people but how did the doctor break it to you Um, so, um, I just turned 50 years old. I had a landscaping business where I was designing landscaping and swimming pools all over the Valley. And, um, I started out just feeling a little bit tired Mm. and I have pretty good energy. Yeah. And, and I started out getting, (laughs) getting some, getting some aches and pains. And I have something that I call the male mentality. I'll be okay tomorrow. (laughs) But the problem was every day I got up, it was worse. The pain got worse. The fatigue got worse. I started losing some weight. And um, was this over weeks or months? Over a couple months. Yeah. A couple months. Even started taking aspirin, which I don't like to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, then the pain started out running the aspirin. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a Thursday and Friday night where I was, uh, during the day, I was actually carried my briefcase into my office. And, um, and, and just from carrying a briefcase on one side of your body, my spine was, was, was just, it was so painful. And uh, so uh, it was a Friday night, and I actually took my two boys downtown Gilbert for some food trucks. And uh, I couldn't find a comfortable place to sit. And I was blaming all the chairs, you know, not thinking it was my body falling apart. And uh, when we got home that night, um, I told him, I said, I'm going to go and uh, go to the ER Mm -hmm. and see if they can figure out what's going on here. And so that night, I headed over to Gilbert Mercy Hospital, and um, my... uh, to say my life changed and went in a different direction is an understatement. Yeah. Is that, did you find out that night or did they, did they send you for some follow up or? Um, so that night what happened was um, they took a bunch of scans and x-rays and tests. And as the results started coming back in, the ER doc would poke her head in my room and say, your x-ray just got back. You got two fractured vertebrae in your back. <laughs> I'm like, what? I'm like, wait a minute. Um, I haven't fallen. Who walks around with a broken back? And she says, well, there's more to come, but I've got an idea what's going on here. And at about three in the morning, the door opened and closed. And she came in and pulled this chair up next to the, 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 the little hospital cot that I was laying on. And she said, I got bad news. Everything that you're going through is cancer related. Hmm. And that was the first time I heard the C word, yeah. the little C word. Yeah. Wow. So what was the, di- the final diagnosis um, that you so- had? Yeah, so specialists were brought in to do all the biopsies into the bone marrow and lymph nodes and everything. And um, I was diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer that I let go for a long time. And it goes to where it's fed and it got into my bones and my lymph nodes. And the reason why the, the, the specialist was in shock when I walked back into the room to hear the results of these, of these tests, um, he sa- actually said, um, I can't believe you just walked in here. He was he was surprised you were even walking. And I said, uh, Doc, you know, what's up? And he says, well, I've never seen a scan like this, and the guy's still walking around. You have cancer in 90% of the bones in your body. Man, 90%? 90%. Wow. Yeah. So what was that? I mean, that had to be three in the morning then. You find that out. How old are your boys at the time? Uh, 14 and 15. Okay, so you have a 14-year-old and a 15-year-old boy. And you find out you have cancer and it's progressed a lot. Like that's, I mean, yeah. what, did that feel like a death sentence? Oh, absolutely. You know, my head's spinning, you know, the big tears are going down my face and I'm thinking in my head, is this a short journey or long journey? Um, I, I have two boys to raise. Mm-hmm. All these things are going through my mind. And um, so, you know, you you plan for a lot of things in your life. You know, you plan about your kid's graduation or somebody getting married and you plan for things like that. You don't plan for things like this. 
That's so true because a lot of the people that I've talked to that go through something like this, that's exactly what they say. They, they go, I just always assumed I'd be at my daughter's wedding. Yeah. I just assumed I'd be at my son's graduation. Yeah. But you don't assume you'd be in a hospital hearing something like this. So, Absolutely. Man, that, that did change the whole trajectory of your life, though, didn't, didn't it? Because, I mean, first of all, you've experienced amazing things since then. But talk a little bit about how that changed everything. Okay, so basically, I'm trying to figure out um, what am I going to do with my boys because I just was told by um, a cancer doctor that um, I had stage four prostate cancer and maybe three months to live. And uh, there was nothing the medical industry could do at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so they are going to um, send me home just to be at peace with my family. And that night, I get a knock on the door, and it's two hospice nurses. So not only was I diagnosed, it was terrible, stage four, nothing the medical industry can do, but two hospice nurses are sitting on my living room couch and I'm thinking it doesn't get any worse than no, this. No, I mean, they're just there to try to make your last months comfortable for yep, you, right? Yep, and that's what they were doing, writing wow. prescriptions for pain meds. They wrote a prescription for a hospital bed to uh, sit downstairs in my house so I wouldn't have to climb my flight of stairs. Um, and, uh, so I'm thinking, you know, I need to get my boys, um, to Ohio where I'm from, um, so that when I melt away, my family can take care of them. Mm. So I bought three plane tickets for, um, seven days away. So the following Sunday, I'm going to jump on a plane with my boys and get them back to Ohio. And my family's waiting on the other end. And, um, what happens is, um, um, I started thinking about it and I go, well, you don't move all of your stuff across the country if you've got three months to live, right? And so all that stuff that I worked my tail off my entire life to get that big screen TV and the leather couches and the really cool furniture and stuff, all that stuff I worked so hard all of a sudden became absolutely nothing to me, nothing. Man. And as friends called and said they wanted to swing by and give me a hug, I said, bring your truck or bring a U-Haul and take anything you want. And people are like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, you don't you don't move your stuff across the country if you've got three months to live. Anything that's here on Saturday that's not out the door is going to go out on the curb and anybody can have it that wants it. If that's not a lesson on what's really valuable, right? You yeah. take your boys with you Yep. and a handful, but, the, but most of the stuff... Meant absolutely nothing. Huh. Yep, and I watched it drive away happily. I was glad it was going somewhere. Mm, Somebody yeah. got it. And so on Saturday, my boys kind of joked and they said, Dad, where are we sleeping tonight? You gave away our beds. <laughs> and I said, I don't, oh, I don't know. Sure. And so I said, let's just get a room down, down at the Hilton, uh, Tapatio Cliffs. You know, it's close to the airport because tomorrow we're just jumping on a plane to fly out of here. So we get a, we get a. No, they know, right? They know. They know. Yeah. You, you've, you've talked to them. Do they know that you maybe only have a few months? Yeah, that was, you... that was when I came in and sat them down on the couch. And, um, that was, uh, probably one, one of the hardest days of my life. Oh. Um, you know, it's like, you, nobody plans for this mm -hmm. and to tell your boys that, um, the doctors say I'm really, really sick. Mm. It was really hard. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh. And, uh, so they knew. And so we stayed at the Hilton the next morning I get up and went down the hallway and I heard something pop and I landed on my face on the floor and I'm laying there and I can't move. And the pain through my back and my neck and my head was so excruciating um, that um, the hotel security came, 911 was called, um, eight firefighters get me onto a hospital gurney down the steps and into an ambulance, and the ambulance gets me one mile from there is John C. Lincoln Hospital in Central Phoenix. Mm. And at John C. Lincoln Hospital, they're running their own scans and tests, and they said the popping sound that you heard um, when you hit the floor uh, was your spine. Um, your your bones are so fragile from the cancer that you just had a compression fracture, which means just you're, walking. Your back broke in two places just walking down the hall, and so and so at that time they brought in two spinal surgeons, a house doctor and a cancer doctor, and these 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 this this group became my medical team, and they're running all the scans and the tests and everything. And when all the scans and tests came back, and they're looking at them, they walk into my room, and they say, um, "We're looking at all this and." Um, we, we want to fight this. And mm. I said, <laughs> I, I was already put in hospice. You know, how do you, how do you fight mm. something like this? Mm -hmm. And they said, um, we want to do two surgeries tomorrow. Um, we have to stop the feeding of the cancer and then start killing the cancer. And so the surgeries were going to be an orchiectomy, which stops the testosterone production in the male body. 
The other surgery is called a port, and that's a little guy that goes under your skin. And, 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 and what that port does is it's in place so that when they stick the needle in there with the chemo coming through, they have a place that it goes in straight into an artery. And so they said, we're going to do the, the, first, the first surgery, the orchiectomy. Then we're going to do the, um, the, the port. And then the next day, we're going to start chemo. So stop feeding the cancer, start killing the cancer. So you were, you were on your way to Ohio and all of a sudden they're talking about doing two surgeries and yeah. fighting this thing. Yeah. And I said, let's go. <laughs> you know, this is what, this is the best thing I heard in weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, let's go. Mm -hmm. This is uh this is pretty amazing. We got some positive things. We're going forward here. We're, we're at least fighting back a little bit, yeah. you know? And the next day I was rolled into two surgeries, back to back surgeries. And, um, um, I remember every light in the room, nurses names, everything, all the way to the point where they actually um, administered the anesthesia into my um, IV and knocked me out for the surgeries. And um, I'm waking up, it's two hours later, I'm in the recovery room of this old hospital and I'm looking around and all I remember was it was kind of a long room and there was a lot of curtains um, and they were getting a lot of people ready for surgeries, bringing people back out from their surgeries. And after the nurses realized I was awake, they brought over some water, said your, your family's upstairs waiting for you. Um, and, um, then the two doctors that did the surgeries came in one by one and explained the surgeries went perfectly, what my follow-up would look like once I left the hospital and everything. And so I said, okay, we're moving forward. You know, this is pretty good. And so I'm laying there, I'm just wanting to go upstairs and the nurses said, it's going to be any minute now. And as I'm laying there watching everything going on around me, um, the, the whole room turns weird, cold, weird, cold for no reason. Hmm. And I'm thinking, the air conditioning, um, somebody left a door open mm -hmm. at the end of the room, mm -hmm. what's going on here? And I looked down at the door at the end of the room um, to see if it was left open and it was closed. And so then I start to kind of pan back to my left and as I get over my left shoulder, somebody's standing there and I kind of jump and I'm thinking it's a doctor or it's a nurse. And the person that's standing there, the right foot steps out towards me, the right hand reaches out and touches me on the left shoulder physically. Mm -hmm. and But when it touches me on the shoulder in my head, it says... You're in the presence of Jesus. Mm. And I'm laying there and I look up again and he's gone. Three to four seconds of my life, according to what I just heard in my head, I was in the presence of Jesus. And I'm flipping out. I'm like, what just happened? What was that? And why me? Mm. And uh, so uh, I was wheeled upstairs to my room and the nurses come in and they say, it's time for some meds. And they've got these little paper cups full of drugs. And they're like, okay, here's your steroids for shrinking the tumors. And they'd hand me a cup and I would take that and take some water and down it. Here's your bone strengtheners. Now your pain meds are as needed. And that morning I was on liquid morphine and uh, they hand me, they, they say your pain meds are as needed. So on a scale from one to 10, 10 being the worst, how bad your pain right now. And so I'm sitting there for a couple of seconds and I'm thinking about this. And then I sat up in the bed and I'm looking at him and I'm like, I don't feel any pain. And they said, order something. You just, you know, you broke your back and had yeah. two surgeries, order something. And I said, I don't like taking aspirin. I'm not, I'm not going to take a drug if I don't need it. From May 26, 2015 to hang out with you right now, I never touched another pain med. They piled up on my kitchen counter over here in Gilbert. And I took two grocery bags down the street, down Williamsfield to the fire department, and I gave it to them and they disposed of them for me. I didn't need them. I never touched another pain med. And, and wow. the, the, the whole experience, there's so much detail, there's so much you know, stuff in this journey. Um, and, 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 and of course, with me just being like that problem solving guy, like what happened? What was this? Why did this happen? What was going on here? Um, that night laying in bed, I couldn't sleep. And I'm, my, 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 my head was spinning. And I was like, what was that? And, and why am I not ordering pain meds? Cause this morning I was on liquid morphine and normally I go to bed at eight 30 or nine o'clock. Cause I'm an old farm boy from mm -hmm. Ohio. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you're up at four in the morning. I'm up at four, four thirty, ready to feed the animals. <laughs> and, uh, so what happens is I'm laying there and I didn't wash my face and I didn't turn off the lights and I'm laying there just thinking, what is going on here? Um, and, 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 and also a part of that is that, that thing that I think every cancer, any person that hear, hears the word, you have cancer, the feeling sorry for yourself. Mm. I just turned 50. I got two boys at home. You know, I'm going through all these things and I'm thinking, 
what's what's going on? And I watched the clock on the wall go 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock. I'm never up this late, right? And I'm laying there in the bed. It's after midnight. And I finally look at the ceiling and I go, God, what gives? <laughs> that was my prayer. What gives? Uh, I've got two boys at home. You know, I've, I haven't achieved the things in life that I want to achieve. There's so many things I want to do yet. Is this a short journey or a long journey? Mm. And as I'm laying there, just, just, just like, just can't believe what's going on. All of a sudden I hear something in my head. And the first thing I heard was, you've been a fighter your whole life. What are you doing? Mm. And I'm like, whoa. Wow. And a couple of seconds go by. And then I hear, as long as you're alive, be fully alive. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is exactly what I needed to hear. And so I set up in the bed, my feet hit the floor. I grabbed my IV pole, which had all my fluids and stuff. And I was going to go to the bathroom and wash my face. And instead of going in the bathroom, I went onto the hospital floor and I started walking. And the nurses were flipping out. You shouldn't be out of your bed without physical therapy. What are you doing? I said, I, I actually feel pretty good. And I ended up walking two laps at a snail's pace, just walked slow, but I, two laps I get back to the room, I wash my face, I turn off the lights, and I get in bed and I look at the ceiling and I go, God, thank you. That's exactly what I needed. I was always the, I was always the guy that made everybody else laugh. You know, I was always the guy that made everybody smile. You know, I was that guy. And through this cancer mess that was going on in my head and around me, um, I missed that guy. I miss, and I said, God, I miss, I miss me. And right now, I'm going to be me no matter what's going on around me. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to be fully alive. And, um, that night, um, what, what that, that whole day was, 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 as you can imagine, um, just, just so unbelievable, beautiful, scary, crazy to me, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and the reason why, um, it's just something I talk about a lot is because, um, what I realized in the next couple of days is when I was touched on the shoulder, I was completely healed of terminal cancer and broken bones in my body. Wow. Wow. And then that night was the first time at 50 years old that I had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm. I'm like, it's me and you now, buddy. We're in this together. Yeah. You guide, yeah. you orchestrate. I'm just going to, I'm just going to follow your lead. I've been bumping my head into the wall my whole life, trying to figure things out. Chuck's plan's okay. It's cool. It's good. This is okay. And um, I'm exhausted. And so now I'm just going to do your plan. And I started doing uh, God's plan uh, that that day, that night, the next day, the next week, the next month, the next uh, eight years. And um, the the blessings that poured out are are almost unbelievable. Yeah. You don't regret it? Um, you know, you hear a lot of people talking about cancer and uh, cancer is a teacher. And what I mean by that is it makes you stop everything. What, what, what is everybody doing in life? Their kids, their job, you know, the right. months blow by, the years blow by. I was that guy. I watched my time go by to have the nice furniture and all these bank account and all this house and pool and trucks um, and wasn't really living life. Cancer stops you in your tracks. And so cancer stopped me and made me realize, am I, I'm not achieving what I really want to achieve in life. And, 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 and I, I, know, I know the reason why I love talking to people and telling my story is because I hope you don't go through cancer. I hope you learn from me. Yeah, we can learn that without going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Man, I love what you said about it being a teacher, though. Yeah. But in some ways, that's only, allow, that's only if you allow it to teach you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because there is the potential that you can have a teacher. So for you, it was cancer. For some of us, we have a teacher that's come and, but maybe we've ignored that voice. Yeah. But, and how about, how about the fact is stage four cancer, you have three months to live. Are you, are you not thinking this is a dead end? Like I was oh, yeah. thinking, oh yeah, this is a complete dead end, done deal. And I left Jesus out of the equation. You still weren't thinking that until... I still wasn't thinking that, but I had a lot of people around me praying for me. Uh, I had a lot of people around me praying yeah, for me. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. A good reminder the it wasn't that I wasn't thinking about it. I wasn't thinking about it because I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus at that time. I yeah. did not have that. I didn't realize how important that was in life. And the crazy thing about it is it's important in life, 
but life here is like minute compared to yeah. eternity. Yeah. You know, that's me standing in Hawaii last week, looking at the ocean going, this is eternity with you. Yeah. This is our little life here. How important is that? How many people can I take with me? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's where your mind started shifting. Yeah. And I can see where you're saying like your life, it's almost like your life pre-cancer and your life post-cancer. A lot of ways are, are different. A lot of, Night right? and day, like night, night and day. day. Yeah. Uh, it can be pre-cancer, post-cancer, or it can be um, pre-Jesus, post-Jesus. Uh, yes. And see, with me, I say pre-Jesus, post-Jesus. Yes. But when you talk to anybody else. Because cancer was just your teacher. Yeah. Yeah. But if you talk to anybody else, they're like, cancer, you know, they, they flip out, yeah. you know. But for me, it was like, man, Jesus stepped in and look at my life now. Yeah. I'm yeah. a different guy. So let me fast forward because I want to ask you a really tough mm -hmm. question right now. Mm -hmm. And... um. But I have to fast forward in the story a little bit to ask this tough question because you meet your wife. I'm, we're going to come back to some of this, but you meet your wife as you're going through the cancer treatment, Hannah, and you get married and you guys have this amazing story. Um, we're going to come back to that because here's my tough question. Uh, she just passed away in November. Mm -hmm. How do you wrestle through or help people wrestle through because God does this miraculous healing with you and he chose not to with her. Mm. How have you processed that? Well, well, I have to, I have to correct you okay? because I, I said the same thing. You know, I was the guy rubbing essential oils on Hannah's spine and on her head and praying three, five, six times a day for complete healing from head to toe. Right. And, and she passed away. And that next day when I took my dog for the walk, um, I was just talking to God and I was like, God, I was praying so hard. I was praying for complete healing. And then I hear a voice and God says, I gave her complete healing. It just wasn't the way you saw it. So, 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 and that was, that was, I was like, whoa, you know, wow. And, 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 and it was crazy because, um, I do a lot of my things now through social media because of my story and my journey and other people watching that. And, and, and a couple of days after she passed, God said, you know, do a live on social media. And I was like, no way I'll be crying like a baby. And God says, do a live. And I said, okay, I you know, promised you that night in that bed, I would, I would say yes to everything you say. I started alive and, and I talked a little bit about what I was going through. I cried a little bit. And then um, I told that story. And I said, you know, God said, she's, she's completely healed now. She's dancing in heaven. You know, she's with me. She doesn't have a port in her chest for, for, for chemo. She doesn't have broken bones through our body. She's not in pain. And, and, and I said, wow. And I, and I, and I said that in the live and I didn't realize it until I got about 40 or 50 messages over the next four weeks of how that statement changed somebody's life because of the way they were looking at losing their loved one. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and if, if you knew Hannah's life, Hannah was the one that, um, was much smarter than me. You know, she, she was first in the Bible. Somebody would start a phrase, she would finish it. Mm -hmm. And I would stand there like, well, how do you know that? You know, it was so cool, you know? And so, um, I was, I was, she always, she was like, it was, it was the, it was the chemistry God put us together. Cause I was the guy on fire, just loved Jesus. And, and she loved watching me go and tell my story, but I loved listening to her because she was, she was definitely educated in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And, and we started our days with a cup of coffee and a Bible study. And, um, so it was, uh, it was, a it was, a uh, it was a divine, it was, it was a divine mm -hmm. relationship. Mm -hmm. And we, we seen that almost right away when we first met yeah. and started talking about cancer. Yeah. And that's how it ended up, uh, falling in love, getting married. And, and the two of us together started the foundation, started Living Hope Cancer Foundation together because we had so many calls coming in with people going, what do you do for this? What do you do for that? And, 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 and one day she's like, I think we should start a foundation. And I'm like, I got a landscaping business over here that's, you know, that, that's really giving me a hassle. You know, I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so we started, uh, we started uh, reading about it and asking some attorneys for some advice and um, it's kind of a cool story because um, the attorneys wanted like twelve thousand, fourteen thousand dollars, and they guaranteed that we'd be off the ground in six months with a five hundred one c three nonprofit. And we looked at each other and started laughing, like we don't have twelve thousand dollars. So we go on, we start watching on, we start googling stuff, watching YouTube videos, how to how to do a mission statement, how to you know everything to do with the nonprofit. And so then we end up downloading the paperwork, and we actually sat there and we read through and prayed through every page hmm. and, and mm -hmm. every, every single page. And, um, 
you pay a fee. I think it was like 185, 150 bucks and it goes off. And then what they do is they go through it. And when they find the things that they need corrected, they send it back. And so this is why it takes six months, yeah, a year yeah. to get a nonprofit off of off the ground. You don't have to repay that that money. You just have to keep fixing it until it's right. Yeah. Take yeah. some time. And so 30 days go by and we're sitting out front. We took our food out there and had a table in the driveway saying hi to all our neighbors and everything. And she walks down to the mailbox and comes back and she's flipping letters on my lap. This is for you. This is for you. And she goes, this one's definitely for you. And she flips it over and I look down and it says IRS on it. <laughs> And I open it up. This is 30 days after we sent it in. And it said, congratulations, you're a 501c3 nonprofit. 30 days later. Wow. 30 days without later. Without the attorneys and everything. Yeah, without the attorneys and everything. You, What year did you meet her? Um, we met in, uh, in 2019. Okay. Uh, because of cancer. My cousin introduced me to her. Stage four breast cancer, triple negative, the monster of all, because it's not controlled by hormones or anything anymore. And the doctors are just trying everything to, to, to slow it down. And uh, we actually got it to a, a place through even like um, a vitamin uh, drip and, and things like that, alternative things. And it was staying stable. And then about five months after we got married, um, um, it, it started falling apart. Um, mm -hmm. she, they found cancer in her neck. Her neck broke. Emergency surgery, broken bones uh, uh, in her lower spine, seven hour spinal surgery traumatized me. I was like, they said she was going to be in there two hours, seven hours later, this surgeon comes walking out and he looked like he just ran a marathon. He was pulling off all of his scrubs and stuff and he was covered with sweat. And he says, um, when we opened up her back to, um, to just stabilize that area, there was so much cancer there that we, we didn't expect we we're going to run into that. And, 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 and so this is the kind of stuff that we went through and, um, we prayed through and constantly Hannah would say, um, this is temporary that, that wheelchair you got me temporary. And four months later, after a seven hour spinal surgery, she's jet skiing on the Colorado river. Wow. So she wasn't just saying it was temporary. Her goals were, it was temporary yeah. and she would get in our pool with a floaty cause she couldn't walk, um, down the sidewalk but she could walk in the pool and that's where she got her strength back and before you know it she's walking and so she did this she did this uh quite a few times throughout this journey and then um last year um we had uh, a, a once in a lifetime beautiful experience um i rode a road bike from san diego to saint augustine florida 3000 miles and it, that that's was a long way. That's a long ways. And it was a personal goal of can a guy after stage four cancer and at 58 years old do this, you know? So that's what was on my mind. And, um, and she was on your support crew, right? And she was the support crew. She, she was, was driving the, the RV. She was had my dog in the RV behind us. It was just you two? Just us two. I didn't realize that. I knew you yeah. did that, but no, it was just the two of she us. She was the support she crew. She was the support crew. And we had a little speaker in our ear, so we were talking while you know I was riding, and um, and 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 three days into this um, seventy-five day ride, th fifty miles a day for three thousand miles, three days into it, the people that God was putting in our path, and I forgot all about me, like this fifty-eight-year-old guy trying to see if I could even climb these mountains coming out of San Diego. Mm -hmm. It was all about. God's plan that day and who he was going to put in our path. And we did that for two and a half months. You just, people would be showing up in, in your story and everywhere, everywhere could be a laundromat in, in some little town in California. It could be in a, in an RV park. Do you remember? Can you give us an example of one? Oh, Can you remember or? which one you want to hear about? <laughs> I mean, it was, it was insane. A uh, pulling up, um, in a, in a town and getting gas, talking to somebody at the gas station and telling them our story, hugging them. And they're like, I'm going to come and get you tonight and take you to dinner. And then we, some total stranger come and take us to dinner and take us to the grocery store to buy groceries. And at dinner and at the grocery store, we're talking to people about our story. Mm -hmm. And that person got to see it happen like that all over the country, wow. all over the country. Wow. Yeah. So what happened was um, some ups and downs uh, through the bike ride. Um, there was a pretty nasty wreck in uh, Louisiana where I hit a metal grate in the road and went over the handlebars. And uh, was in a hospital in Baton Rouge for uh, three days. Um, and they came back and said, nothing's broken. You probably got some nerve damage because you hyperextended everything. I'd probably stay off a bike for three or four months and 
the next day I was back on the bike riding again. <laughs> and the yeah. first two days were kind of shaky. Yeah, you know, I'm looking yeah. at sticks on the road and bumps and stuff. But on day three, I started riding pretty good. And I mean, this is just the way I looked at it. We already rode 2,300 miles. We already put all this effort into this. I said, if I can physically get back on that bike, I'm finishing this ride. I'm not quitting. Mm -hmm. And so we end up quit. We end up we end up finishing on on June 10th. Rolled into uh, uh, St. Augustine, Florida. Um, it was absolutely incredible. There was like four different news stations there buzzing around us like bees, and we were laughing like, "Look at this! This is crazy!" You know. And um, and 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 so what happened was when we got back from that bike, that incredible bike journey, um, Hannah started having some migraine headaches. Got some tests done. And they found three tumors in her on her brain. And the suggestion at the time was that she get full brain radiation because we don't want this stuff popping up. You know, we want to just stop it right now. Well, some people's bodies can take radiation and some people's can't. Hannah got full brain radiation and hers could, she couldn't take it. Her body started melting down. Mm -hmm. And so the next four months was um, um, nothing short of a nightmare, you know of the pain and me mm -hmm. being caregiver and taking care of her. And, um, and I lost her on November 29th. And, uh, and, and, and if I didn't have faith, um, I'd probably be drunk right now. <laughs> yeah. That's not a joke. I mean, I, I've, I've, you know, I, I thought about, it. I was like, reach for that bottle and just numb yourself up yeah. or just pray through this. Yeah. God, you got me, you got me. And, and the beautiful thing that happened also right after she passed away was thousands and thousands of letters from emails, text messages. And these were coming in from all over the world. People following our foundation. This is, this is international now um, because we're on YouTube in places that don't have any boundaries. And we're getting emails from Germany um, of groups of people that are following our story and that are heartbroken because of Hannah. Um, you know, Hannah's passing and, and we're telling me how much Hannah inspired them. Mm -hmm. And I seen these messages and all these letters and stuff. And I was like, when I got in the first couple of days, it was over 2000. And over the next week, it was over 4,000 messages. And God said, now, you know, the why mm -hmm. and the why, the why, the reason why I say the why is because as a cancer coach, we lose a lot of people. It's can't, we're in the cancer world. We're in that industry. So, so what happens in that industry is you lose somebody that you became very close to. And it's, it's hard. It's the hardest part. It's the hardest thing that I do. And, and, and the, and another thing was after the person passed, um, their loved ones being really upset. Why? Mm -hmm. They didn't know the why, why did this happen? He was going to retire next year. We were getting an RV. We were going to go around the world and now he's gone. Why? And I seen people stay mad for years. Mm -hmm. And, and, and within a few days after Hannah passed away, God said, now, you know, the why. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was like a gift to you. It's like a gift. And, and, and it's hard, you know, the waves hit me and stuff. Um, one of her favorite songs comes on, you know, or, or just, um, in Hawaii, I'm on one of the most beautiful beaches I've ever been on in my life, looking at this crystal clear water and the sun and the mountains and the volcanoes and the tropical plants around me. And I'm sitting there by myself. Mm. And I said, man, I didn't, you know, I, I, I wasn't ready for this. Mm -hmm. So that, that trip, even though I had a ch an opportunity to speak to a lot of people on the big Island about my cancer testimony and, and what happened, um, was also a heal, a healing time for me. Yeah. You know, you've been so transparent with this journey. I, I, I've been following you and you posted recently, um, if I can get through this sentence, but you posted recently, you said, after my loved one passed away, I used her towel in the bathroom for two months. I can't get through it. Yeah. It's, I think because we were so close, we did everything together. It was so beautiful that God put her in my path that I was, I mean, I, I asked her to marry me and driving home. I was like, God, you had this plan for me. Wow. I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. I was that blessed. And we did so much stuff together. And it's been five months now. And I'm still reaching for my phone to send her a text. I just miss her. And I uh, I know, I don't know if it'll get any easier. It hasn't yet. Five months, you know. But um, I don't know um, how people get through this without faith.
Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because like you're saying, even even day, within days, God gave you a gift for it and uh, with it, giving you a why. But um, I imagine how it comes in waves. Um, I imagine. And, you know, I, I maybe I can get through this now, but um, you said after my loved one passed away, I used her towel in the bathroom for two months, cuddled her pillow so I could sleep and put her picture in every room of the house. Yeah, I... We did a, a lot of a lot of videos because we have a cancer foundation. Yeah. Um, we did a lot of videos um, on the bike ride. Um, and I still, five months later, end my day with a little prayer time, mm -hmm. and I watch one of her videos. Mm -hmm. A lot of people tell me, oh, I can't go, I can't look at her videos. I can't look at her you know, pictures. I have to. Mm -hmm. That's my memories. And at first, I couldn't look at the the last year because she had lost her hair from chemo. She had, um, you know, her physical uh, body started to change. At first, I couldn't look at those ones because it was just too hard. Mm -hmm. So I'd go look at the ones when we first met, and she had this long, dark hair, and, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the ones I went to, you know. And, and it was kind of interesting because I started watching these videos, and I started picking up things that I didn't pick up in the past. Really? Yeah, there was one where we were on our honeymoon, and the last night in Oceanside, we wanted to take some pictures of, um, while the sun was setting behind us, and and I was waiting for her on the beach, and she come walking down with her wedding dress on, and these little girls were talking to her, and uh, and and I said, "What did they say?" And she says, "They said we love your dress," and she told him, "I just got married," and then she turned to me. I don't remember ever seeing this. And she says, this is every girl's dream. This is my dream dress. And she got to experience her dream dress with me. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's the videos. It's the, yeah. it's the, it's all the things we've worked on so many projects for the foundation that are launching now. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, here you go, babe. Yeah. We're doing it. We're yeah. doing it. Chuck, how do you, how do you, you know, even with our audience listening, and I know I'm asking this question, I know you're in the process of it, but how do you deal with your grief? Because as you said before, in the, in the thing that you're dealing with, you're, you're dealing with more than just the grief of the loss of your wife. You, you were telling me before we turned the mics on that you make friends with some of these cancer patients yeah, and then some of them pass away. Um, so you're having to deal with grief a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, the first couple of times it happened um, early in this, I don't even know if we had a foundation. I was just loving on cancer people um, and I lost somebody. And I hung up the phone in tears and I said, God, you want me to do this? This is hard. And God says, keep on going. You're getting stronger. You're getting better. And so you just keep on going, you know. Um, like I said, I, I don't, I, just for, because of the person that I am, I will never be comfortable. I, I could not be a hospice nurse. You know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not good at that. I can't be around the end of life. Um, um, what I just experienced with Hannah, um, and just looking in other people's eyes and seeing what they're going through also. Um, but, um, it's, it's so hard, but, um, all of the rest of my journey and my purpose that God had set for me is so important and is so amazing um, that this old farm boy, this old landscaper pinches himself because yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people about, um, my testimony and I'm, I'm changing lives. I'm touching lives and, uh, and I see them and, and I've got people, I'm telling them my story in the park while I'm walking my dog and they're in tears and I give them a hug. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I didn't want to make you cry. And they're like, I've had a really tough three years. And I was kind of thinking recently, maybe I should go back to church. And I just heard your story. And this Sunday I'm going back to church mm. and I give them a hug and I walk away and I start crying. I'm like, oh, you want me to bring people to you? Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. All of this was before for that reason. And then I started maturing into that of what that meant, what that looked like, what that felt like, um, how hard it is sometimes. Um, but is it worth it? Mm. Every second, every second. Wow. So tell us about the, the tattoo right here on this, this arm. 
Oh my say? gosh. Well, um, so me and Hannah were sitting side by side. We had our desks next to each other in our house. That's where we ran our foundation from. And I was talking to a, a guy going through cancer on the speakerphone, and he just said, I haven't been out of out of bed in weeks. The di- diagnosis, you know, the aches and pains, um, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. And Hannah's sitting next to me, and she says, you got to tell him he needs to get up and live. He's, he's not going to live life. He's not going to experience anything in that bed. And I told him, I said, you got to get up and live. And I just, after I hung up the phone, I told her, I said, I love that phrase. I love that phrase. So we started saying, get up and live. And at the moment, at the moment of dealing with somebody going through cancer, it's a physical thing. You got to get up and live. And um, we started saying it so much that me and Hannah went and got matching tattoos that say, get up and live on them. And, um, and, 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 you know, we've got all kinds of pictures of us together showing our tattoos or people would ask us and we would show them our tattoos. And what I realized was when you say get up and live, it, it, it's the physical thing, but the mental thing has to really kick in fast. Okay. Um, I'm going to start getting out of bed today and, uh, taking a shower and being human again. Um, the women say, I'm going to put on my makeup for the first time in months and just feel good about myself. I'm going to go for a walk with my husband or with my wife tonight. They start out these little baby steps and these mini goals, but they're getting up to live. And what happens is they realize that cancer is a situation, not a sentence. Mm. Everybody thinks it's a sentence when they hear the C word and they flip out and they start shutting down in fear. And so we step in and say, you know what? You got to get up and live. And what we realized was it wasn't just get up and live um, physically and mentally, but on a huge scale, how about get up and live spiritually? Mm -hmm. And if we can start, hi, can I say a little prayer for you right now? You know, and, and that's where it started and, 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 and encourage them to get up and live spiritually as well, because it sure helps you get through this, through this journey. Absolutely. This journey called life, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and that's where, um, when you shared a little bit about that before and then watching your journey online, it, it, it's definitely in your world, you're dealing specifically with cancer patients, but that is, that's a message we can all take. You get up and live. It's, it's. God's heart for us, isn't it? Yeah. And, and you know, when you see social media, um, you know that there's probably going to be maybe 25, 30% of the people watching and following and, and really into this journey of, 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 of us being completely transparent. Um, but w- who are the other 70% mm-hmm. people that didn't have cancer, but are exactly what you just said. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if they can do this going through stage four cancer, maybe I need to get up and live a little bit myself. Mm-hmm. And it's, it is, it's touching people's lives. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes, yeah. Chuck. So, so then you guys have a foundation, and that's what it is, right? Get up and live. Yeah. The foundation is called Living Hope Cancer Foundation, and that's something we prayed through also, and that's what came to us was Living Hope Cancer Foundation. So that's what we're registered. Um, get up and live phrase is so easy to pass around in the park, at the grocery store, you know, anywhere I'm at, that we say it all the time. We say it so much that we patented it. We actually own Get Up and Live now, uh, which is a hoot. You know, I yeah, can't even yeah, believe it. Fun. You know, um, but um, basically, um, getupandlive.org was so easy for, for us to give out and just to tell somebody. And they're like, how are you going to forget that? You know, yeah. get, up, get Up and Live. I can remember that. So even if I didn't have a business card or a sticker or something on me, I could give them. Um, getupandlive.org is our website and it's all free cancer coaching. It's, there's a Bible plan on there. There's, uh, 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 an event that I did last year when a movie crew came to Scottsdale and shot, um, uh, me and my story for the 700 club and all that stuff's on the getupandlive.org site. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, tell us a little bit about these things. You brought these for me and that, that's, that comes from there, right? Well, actually I only brought one of them for you. <laughs> I brought <laughs> I brought you a coffee cup that has a uh, uh, me and Hannah actually from our um, from our honeymoon uh, that night when we were at the beach uh, we jumped and did the old you know yeah in motion That's shot what that is. and uh, I kept looking on Canva and all these places to to find somebody celebrating and one day Hannah's like what about us what about this thing of us and so our us us jumping became our our, our living hope cancer foundation yeah. logo. And then on the, on the back, I put a, we, we found a Bible phrase that we love about living hope. 
Yeah. So that is for you. That's a coffee cup. Oh, well, thank you. And then I've got this other little guy here. So I've got a dog at home named Jax that came into my life through my cancer journey. And he was the little guy saying, take me for a walk, you know, get off the couch. Let's get up and live. Let's, get let's go. Live. And so Jax is just a little rock star in my life. And so many people loved him and they kept saying, I want to take Jax home with me. And I kept laughing. You're not taking my dog home with you. And I'd get home and I was like, how could they take Jax home with them? And I came up with this company that duplicates your animal. And we made these little Jax dogs that look exactly like my Jax. And we send these to cancer patients all over the country. And a little tag by his tail actually says free cancer coaching, get up and live dot org. And so I'm giving this to you, but it's not for you. It's for when somebody comes into your life that has cancer, I want you to give that to them. I will do that, my friend. I will definitely <laughs> do that. So, Chuck, how do people find you? Is it getupandlive.org? Yeah, getupandlive.org. So, you know, through this, it's growing so fast that I wish everything was Get Up and Live or Living Hope Cancer Foundation, but it's not. So, um, Chuck Keels on Facebook and Living Hope Cancer Foundation on Facebook. Um, I've got 30,000 followers on TikTok under Chuck Keels, follow, following my journey, um, which is blowing my mind. You know, I'll post something and get 600,000 views, and it's like, what is this? Yeah, yeah. What is this? But it's a platform. Yeah. Um, and so that's under Chuck Keels. And then our Instagram, it's both Chuck Keels and, and Living Hope Cancer Foundation. So um, YouTube, Living Hope Cancer Foundation. So it's not one set thing because it kind of all grew so fast that we're still working on getting it down to one thing. But for someone that needs the cancer coaching, um, we've put 40 videos on uh, getupandlive.org. That is a free cancer coaching for any type of cancer. Um, and then we put 16 more videos that Hannah did about breast cancer. Uh, it's called the Cancer Roadmap Project. It's on getupandlive.org. Um, at the bottom of that website is my email. And I encourage people um, when they told somebody, oh my gosh, I met a guy today that has cancer and I told him about your website and he's going to go on it. And I tell them, I encourage them to go to the bottom, drop me a message. I really want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with that person wow. um, and, and chat with them about um, you know their journey and in their life yeah. and how they're how they're planning on getting through this and hopefully i can be a little bit of a navigation and guidance and support um and i i, I absolutely hate the thought that there are a lot of people out there that are going through a cancer journey by themselves and that is a really really tough one so um, i'm hoping that we can get enough awareness so that people know uh who living hope cancer foundation is so that when the word when the cancer word comes down they're like you got you to gotta get on the site. You got to get a hold of Chuck. Yeah. And this is what, yeah. You, yeah. So get up and live.org. Well, Chuck, our No Gray Areas, no gray areas team, uh, we commend you because you are certainly living out that message to get up and live. I mean, even in the midst of your grief now and in this journey that you're on, you are getting up and you're living and you're making a difference. One of my favorite passages or verses in the Bible is, is Ephesians 2 4, just the first two words of it, where it says, but God. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any tattoos yet, but maybe that's the one I would get is, but God, and that's your story. Uh, you, you were going this way and, uh, cancer became a teacher, but God stepped in that night and man, your life has been completely different since then. And what a journey it's been. And you, you are impacting many, many people and will many more people in the future. No doubt. Yeah. I, you know, the foundation's three years old. I think we're still a baby. Yeah. I have no idea what God's plan is next. And I, I know right. that it's just, uh, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, I'm blessed, you know, I'm humbled. I'm a servant, you know, I'm a humble servant. Um, I'm an old farm boy from Ohio, you know, I'm just pinched myself. I was like, man, I cannot believe I just went to Hawaii and talked to people about my cancer journey. Um, but this is the purpose. This is where he's got me. And so it's, you know, it's, 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 I always tell everybody I'm all in for God. Yeah. I'm all in. Yeah. Love that about you, man. And thank you. Thanks for being an example to all of us on that. So two truths and a lie. Do you, do you think you can stump us now? We've audience has gotten to know you. A so little tell bit. you, tell you three things and you got to find out which one is a lie. Yeah. We got to try to figure out which one is the lie. Okay. I got some pretty cool stuff. Do you guys know who Bob golf is? Yeah. Um, so I spent a couple hours with Bob Golf okay. on, on the beach in, uh, in, in actually in San Diego, where he lives. Um, another cool thing that happened was um, I was meeting with a group of um, political advisors. Um, one of them heard my story at a funeral from a friend of mine. It was like, tell me the story. And I got called into to a meeting and got a chance to fly 
uh, out to Washington for a meeting. And while the meeting was going on, uh, President Trump walked in the room. Wow. That was okay. really, really cool. And then um, um, something back in my younger days when I was in much better shape before cancer and everything, um, I was a fitness model for 15 years and I was in Muslim Fitness Magazine and did a lot of fun stuff with that also. You're good at this game. <laughs> you are good at this game because you told all three of those. Like, I was trying to get like, okay, you're going to like goof up a little bit here and make it sound like. <sighs> okay, I know I get to cheat on this one a little bit because I know you met Bob Goff. Okay. Because I saw that. Yes. I saw that online, which is really cool. If if the audience doesn't know who he is, you need to go check him out. He, man, yeah. guy is full of life, isn't he? So uh, how cool is that? You just ran into him. No, we planned it, you know, okay. through some people and stuff. And we said we were going to be in San Diego. And he says, give me a call. I'm going to be busy, but I'll make it happen. And and he showed up and it was so cool. And Bob, you know, he's an attorney, but he took his money and started building schools in Uganda and yeah. stuff. He's done some amazing things. And if you see him speak all over the world on stage in churches, um, and, 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 I, and that's what was my question was, Bob, you're an attorney. You didn't go to school to be a pastor. And you're, you talk about Jesus just like it's, you know, and I says, so what is your title? And he says, I'm just a dude. Yeah. And I said, I'm just a dude too then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You yeah. two have similar personalities. Because yeah. Bob Goff is just full of life yeah. as you are yeah. too. So, oh man, you know what? You got some guns on you. I could see you do, being in some fitness magazines earlier. So I'm going to say that's the truth too. It is true. Really? Yeah, muscle and fitness and uh, um, did a, well, I modeled for, for 15 years yeah. and I always told the agency, I, I was in such good shape. I said, you don't have to give me a three week warning. I'm ready today because I just stayed in shape. I love fitness yeah. and, and that was part of it. So I modeled in Ohio and I modeled out here and I did some stuff in California. It That's was just fun. Cool. It was just cool. Yeah. It was yeah. fun. So was the middle one, was there any of that that was truth? Like, like, did you speak to a political group and Trump just didn't walk in? Right. So, okay. so I didn't even speak to the group. So I know. Sound. I didn't speak to the group, but what happened was a gentleman, um, and he basically is one of the highest political officials for for President Trump, heard my story at a funeral and called me and said, I want to hear the story. And so I did have the conversation with him, but I, I add a little bit more to it. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Well, great job, my friend. Thank you so much. And, and we appreciate you. And we will well, definitely encourage our listeners to go uh, check out what you're doing and contribute and help and get behind it. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Thanks, thank my thank you so much for inviting me today. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Well, Chuck left us with a lot of things to think about, but certainly the question that you and I need to wrestle with is how we're going to get up and live. I encourage you to think through that, maybe even leave some comments below or email us at info at no And remember to like, follow and subscribe. <laughs>